I'd like to uh, start off the, um, the sessions this afternoon uh, with dual mode CFI DeFi use in VR display IC. This will be a dual uh, presentation by Ahmed Ella, Director of Engineering at Mixel, and Jeffrey Lucanes of Synaptics, Senior Director for IoT Video Products. Mr. Ella is Director of Engineering at Mixel and manages teams working on serial link products such as HDMI, USB, and multi-standard CERTES. Jeffrey Lucance is Senior Director for IoT Video Products with Synaptics for more than six years. Uh, Jeffrey manages discrete touch and video interface product lines. Please welcome Mr. Ella and Mr. Lucance to the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, in our talk today, um, we're going to, like I said, we're going to have two two halves. The first half, I'll go over a GPU to uh, uh, Pixel VR system, uh, and then Ella will come out and talk about a mix the Mixel C5 D5. Um, transmitter that they've developed. So on to the display system. So here's a quick overview of, of a VR solution and just to orientate everybody. So on the input side of most discrete uh, or most graphics sources, whether it be a desktop, a laptop, or even a cell phone, usually outputs display port video over a USB-C connector. Um, and just as a point, the, if you visit the, uh, the demo booth, the Mixel booth, there's a, a demo where there's a um, a newer cell phone that's actually driving 2160 by 2160 displays off of a cell phone. So not, you don't need a, a laptop or a uh, desktop um, to drive this, these types of resolutions anymore. The function of the, uh, the bridge chip is to take DisplayPort data and convert it to, to MIPI and also provide configuration and control um, for the overall system. The dual uh, MIPI inputs are transferred into a display driver chip that's mounted on the display. It's also known as a DDIC. And this, in this case, it's, it is an LCD driver chip that does um, drive the panels. And so yeah, this is the, uh, the overall system. Okay, so VR, um, it's advancing a lot of different uh, aspects uh, as, they, it, as VR evolves to the next generation. The first generation products, I believe, had 1K by 1K displays, and if you, as you look through them, if you put the, the display generally about one inch away from your eye, you, you were able to see spaces between the pixels, and it made it appear like you're looking through a screen door because of the spacing of the pixels. And so the next generation of VR really needs to address this by, uh, by supporting higher resolutions. And so the target is roughly uh, 1,000 uh, pixel per inch is what's you know, a, a target that most are looking to achieve, so that translates into about 2K by 2K um, as a minimum uh, display resolution. 3K by 3K, by 3K is better, and optimum would be 4K by 4K. In addition to the, uh, the resolution, the other aspect that needs to be addressed uh, for the next generation of VR is the responsiveness. Um, as you look at displays that are a couple, couple feet away or even 10 inches away with a cell phone, if you're looking at a display that's one inch away from your eye, you can see more things and different things than you would normally for a different type display. And so for crisp LCD images in the near, uh, near field of view, you need to, uh, the, the, the LCD crystals really need to be stabilized when you start viewing them. So what, uh, what the panel manufacturers would like to try to do is load the, uh, load the pixels in and let them, give them time to settle and then flash the backlight. So whenever you view any pixels, they are completely stable and there's no transitioning, so you don't see any, any blur. And to accomplish this uh, additional time, we need to update the panel faster than it normally would, which means we need more display port bandwidth and more MIPI bandwidth to get the pixels there, um, there sooner. So how do we achieve that with available technologies that are there today? And so first off is you know, the display port, it has uh, 32, gigabits per second, and so many of the, uh, like I said, desktops, laptops, and even cell phones are getting to the point where they can achieve that kind of video output on the, the USB-C connectors. If you need more than that, how do we get higher than that to achieve, uh, to support the higher resolutions? Well, beyond straight video, then we can start turning on DSC compression on DisplayPort, so that'll give us a higher level of uh, bandwidth. 
Even higher than that would be enable DSC over the MIPI link, so that achieves even higher resolutions. And then um, some applications can use sub-pixel rendered uh, video that comes from the GPU all the way to the display, and that would achieve even higher levels of performance. And lastly, there's something that we've uh, created at uh, Synaptics called Fovio Transport, and allows full resolution Fovio images to be trans uh, transferred to the display at using half the, uh, half the, 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 half the display port or MIPI bandwidth. So I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a couple slides. A little bit of an overview on the two, the, two, uh, the chipset um, that we've developed on the bridge chip. It's DisplayPort 1.4, supports all the optional features. It supports uh, both DSC and FEC um, com uh, for compression. It is optimized for very low latency. Um, this is to uh, reduce the, uh, the seasick effect that you get when either, either there's a lag in, in the video or the video and audio are out of sync. And so having as low latency as possible is one of the things that can be done to, to minimize that. This chipset supports single stream mode or multi-stream mode. Single stream is typically used by PCs that can support higher pixel clock rates. Multi-stream is generally more favorable to a uh, cell phone type application where, which can't always run as high a pixel clock. So the chipset can support either one. We do support DSC compression and Synaptic's uh, proprietary um, own compression algorithm that was developed for, uh, for cell phones. Um, and then we also include the D combo D5, C5, which is our, our partners at uh, Mixel developed, uh, and we use it in our product. So it's very nice. It supports 2.5 gigabits per second on D5 and 2.5 giga symbols per second on C5. The DDIC chip complements the bridge chip. It also has a combo D5, C5. It, it supports uh, DS, the, both types of uh, video decoders and it can support up to 4K by 3K uh, resolution displays. There are several extra features that were designed into the display driver chip just for VR. And one of them is, is it has a full view uh, transport um, image overlay. So I'll explain that a little bit in a, in a couple slides, but it does have hardware in there to be able to support full view transport. Um, it also has a FIFO to adjust panel timing uh, to, to adjust the load time versus the scan time and so it uses the FIFO to do that. That eliminates the need to do any um, buffering of the video in the, in the bridge chip. Again, we wanted to minimize the, the latency there. Um, lastly, it supports pixel overdrive. Again, we want to make sure the pixels are all stable whenever the backlight turns on for a near-eye application, and also has a version of local dimming. <clears throat> At this point, you, would like to thank both MIPI and, uh, and Visa for supporting the same uh, DSC uh, compression spec. If there wasn't the same spec, we would have had to implement a decoder and an encoder in the bridge chip, which takes gates, adds power, adds latency and cost, and so we wouldn't, wouldn't have wanted to do that. So it was really convenient for us to, to, that uh, both uh, Visa and MIPI use the same DSC as we bridge uh, video across the, those links. So some of the functionality of a, a bridge chip it does configure the GPU by providing the capabilities of the display subsystem to the GPU. So it, things like uh, what kind of video format, uh, whether it's 420, 444, 8, 8 or 10-bit 10, uh, 10 uh, pixel, what type of compression it supports. But also the bridge chip uh, defines to the GPU what sort of uh, panel and, and uh, frame timing it needs to support uh, to allow the pixel to have a settling time uh, and, and backlight flashing. And similarly, the bridge chip configures the DDIC. Again, it formats what kind of video it's going to be receiving after it gets the information from the GPU, what type of compression, and configures the panel to have you know, specific scan time, subtle time, and backlight flash time. And it, the bridge chip also updates the pixel overdrive, local dimming, and there's a FIFO that can be adjusted uh, for bandwidth adjusted for timing. All right, so I mentioned this uh, idea of foveal transport. It's really based on the concept of foveal rendering. And foveal rendering came about from uh, when uh, gaming applications started using eye tracking. And so if you know where the eye is looking, you can focus on just rendering an image in that three degree field of view that um, your mind really processes that data inside that three, three degree field of view only. 
And so the GPUs would start uh, rendering a foveal image and then a background image with much less uh, resolution. Uh, and, and when they did that, you can improve the, um, uh, it decreases the, the rendering time and increases the frame rate. Uh, and unfortunately, what they did, well, they had no choice, is they combined the two images together, a high resolution foveal image with a lower resolution background image, put the two together, but they ship it out at the full resolution. So unfortunately, the rest of the system cannot take advantage of the, uh, the savings that are achieved. So uh, what we've done at foveal, in foveal transport is we've asked the GPU, uh, the graphics application, to keep the images separate and send them as a concatenated image to the display driver chip. The gaze point where your eye is looking is embedded in display data, so the display driver chip will know how to uh, center the foveal image in, in, fr on, in front of the background image. Um, and then the DDIC will also scale the full frame image and over, in, as part of the overlay. One of the side benefits is chromatic aberration and lens distortion can now be processed in the, uh, where the eye is looking on the full view image, not on the full frame. And I've been told that it increases the accuracy of it if you use it actually where the eye is positioned as opposed to looking just generically doing it across the full frame. So a full view transport ends up using half the data and one half the bandwidth. Okay, so I want to talk briefly then about CFI, DeFi. Uh, we, did, we did bring up on our first system, uh, you know, the, the team, uh, while we wanted to do CFI, um, there's not a lot of ecosystem out there to support CFI. So uh, our, both the panel manufacturers and, and our team internally, really we wanted to bring up DeFi first because there's an ecosystem you can bring the panel up much faster as far as complexity, test equipment, and characterization equipment. So we, for, at least for our product, we brought it up first with DeFi. Then after that, we brought it up in CFI, and it was much easier because we had proved out many of the aspects. So having a combo CFI DeFi really helped us do the product bring up uh, much faster than we probably normally would have uh, for doing the first <coughs> first time bring up of CFI. So I want to walk through an example to to compare CFI DeFi in different configurations. So here's, <clears throat> here's a table, and it's based on an example that's 2880 by 1900. This is a per eye um, example, there's one per each eye, obviously. So in the first case, no compression. And so this will fit into four lanes of HBR3 of DisplayPort, which consumes about 32 of the 32.4 uh, gigabits of data that's available. So pretty much uses every, uh, all the available bandwidth. But in this case, the, the DeFi cannot support that bandwidth, so for an uncompressed case, DeFi is not an option. We have to use six CFI trios to be able to sort the band, support the bandwidth to each of the displays. Now looking at some other combinations, what if we did turn on compression between the bridge and the display? In that case, uh, the, the eight-lane DeFi now could be used, and also the, the CFI drops from six trios down to four trios. If we extend that and turn on two to one compression from the GPU to the display, which is probably the optimum way of doing it, um, now the, uh, the, the GPU can output a four lane HBR2. And for those who aren't familiar with HBR2, that's roughly the data rate that each of our laptops and our cell phones are, run, are generating data at that rate. But it does require uh, compression. Then extending that further to uh, three to one compression, now this gets kind of an interesting case. So a three to one, it can be used two lanes of HBR3. And so now the, the video out of the GPU can, be, can use a standard uh, USB-C cable. A custom cable and a custom connector are no longer required to support um, high resolution VR. Similarly, to, whoops, let me go back up, with uh, 2880 by 1900. So it fits in a normal USB-C cable without anything, any custom. Then lastly, just comparing foveal transport, it looks very similar to the, uh, the two to one case, except there's no compression. It's a full, full resolution image, and it, it also supports you know, two lane HBR3 out of the GPU. And so <clears throat> there's one line missing from this slide. We, I never, because of the schedule, I didn't have time to, our, our team to fill out the power. But there are considerable power benefits as you move left to right across this, and I'll, I'll be updating that. And, Check back with me in a month, and I think we'll have the data updated to, uh, uh, to show the, the power benefits of uh, the lane reduction. Okay, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ella to talk about the very nice C combo C5D5 he developed for us.
Sir. Thanks, Jeff, for, uh, <clears throat> for the interesting insights about the VR. So I'd like to start uh, talking about the uh, VR, as you might know, that it uses uh, immersive devices. So the head-mounted display, the HMDs used for VR are immersive. That means that they isolate uh, the real-world environment from your <coughs> environment you're seeing uh, while wearing the headset. On the other side, there are other reality technologies, such as augmented reality AR and mixed reality MR which are actually um, different than VR, that the device you're wearing is like semi-transparent. It's as if you're wearing a weak uh, pair of uh, sunglasses. And in AR and MR, you're actually interacting with the real world uh, environment and uh, virtual objects are added to your environment. So if, you have, if you're wearing an AR uh, headset, and you have like, you know, um, a virtual object, uh, a pet, for example, walking through this uh, room, then it would uh, recognize all these uh, tables, it would pass through it, it actually identifies or understands the real world environment. And uh, based on it, uh, it uh, that's the way the AR, or that's the major difference between AR and MR uh, versus VR. So, <clears throat> Um, in order for an AR or MR system to uh, identify or understand the surrounding environment, it needs actually some uh, sensors. Uh, so there's environment sensors built into your HMD. There are uh, video capture sensors. There are uh, depth capture, so it can understand the real world uh, environment and interact uh, efficiently with it. So you can kind of uh, exercise a real, uh, you know, uh, reality uh, experience. So, yeah. So based on our experience with our customers in the XR um, domain, we kind of uh, created this um, block diagram. It's like a system diagram to highlight some of the use cases uh, in the XR domain. So uh, the reason uh, we did that is to kind of highlight that in XR, um, uh, there are more interfaces uh, with respect to MIPI uh, other than or beyond the DSi. So in, in, in VR, your, the main uh, interface is the DSi. Uh, in AR and MR, you also have CSi uh, interfaces and uh, we can actually <coughs> um, like uh, map it on this system diagram. So uh, this is like uh, an interface you would find typically in an uh, AR system. So you have multiple environment sensors capturing the environment around you, surrounding you. You have a video capture sensor. You have a depth capture sensor. And all of these typically would be using CSI, uh, trans uh, transmitting CSI data over D5 or C5 uh, to the other side. The other side of the link is typically uh, either a capture processor, uh, it might be the application processor, it can, it can be a bridge chip. It all depends on the XR system you're building. So <clears throat> if you have a bridge chip, for example, which can be used to aggregate the uh, different uh, CSI data coming in, then you need another pair of uh, CSI transmitter receiver to send the data to the application processor. Same case with the capture processor. It depends, like uh, if you're using a tethered uh, VR, for example, or a tethered AR uh, system, uh, you'll need to transfer this data to a PC where all the processing is happening. Um, on the other side, if we're talking about display, as uh, Jeff uh, just talked, uh, you, you'd probably need a bridge chip to convert the data coming from your processor in a, a tethered VR application. You'd need a, a bridge chip to convert the display port data into DSi. And then, of course, you'd need, whether you have a, a, your application processor or the bridge chip, you need to transfer the data to the DDIC uh, through 
uh, <coughs> DSI, which is also uh, using DeFi or CFI. In the DDIC, you also have a, D, a DSI receiver, which is receiving data over DeFi and CFI. So just to uh, highlight uh, this point again, this is not like all the MIPI uh, interface used in XR. This is just kind of our experience through our customers with uh, multiple use cases. And the reason or the point is to highlight that there's uh, a lot of uh, potential applications for the MIPI specs uh, in the XR system. So by the way, we refer to XR, uh, it's like a superset of VR, AR, and MR. So um, with the XR system challenges, uh, we see multiple challenges in the XR systems. Obviously, bandwidth is the first uh, challenge. So we need higher bandwidth for display. Uh, you need high, higher resolution. You also need uh, faster frame rates. For the sensors, you also need high resolution and high dynamic range. On the other side, on the chip side, there is uh, more challenges or more points to consider. First point and the most important is the power. So for head-mounted display, for VR and AR applications, uh, thermal efficiency is very important. Of course, you cannot be wearing a headset which is dissipating uh, high uh, uh, power and uh, kind of uh, getting uh, warm because that would be very annoying to you. So power is very important. Of course, being a port uh, portable uh, device, you also care about the power. Uh, the other point is the pin, uh, pin count. So that's also a challenge, which is usually a very important resource in chip design. And uh, minimizing die area is the third point. Uh, luckily, the MIPI spec uh, attributes match um, the biggest challenges we, uh, we can notice in the XR. So specifically, uh, all the new standards are addressing the high uh, bandwidth requirements. So the next generation DSI, CSI, DeFi, CFI, all of them are addressing the high bandwidth. And of course, by definition, MIPI is optimized for low power. So that's a very important attribute, which, which actually highlights why uh, MIPI has a lot of potential or a lot of use cases in such uh, application, the XR domain. So dig, uh, digging deeper into our uh, C, uh, Mixel's C5 DeFi integrated in the VXR7200. So this is a dual mode Phi. It's, uh, it operates at um, like in DeFi mode, DeFi 1.2. It supports C5 1.1. In the DeFi mode, it uh, operates the maximums like four lanes, which uses 10 pin configuration. In the C5 mode, it's a three lane operates as a three-lane mode, which uses nine-pin configuration. Uh, this IP is like highly configurable. It supports um, lane swapping and pin swapping, which is a very good feature, helping in system integration and board and package design. So basically, you can swap the pins uh, in any order you want. It supports uh, this queue in the DeFi mode, like uh, for the 2.5 gig operation. And it supports both T1 and T2 in the CFI mode to give you maximum flexibility based on your use case. And of course, it's very important to have a BIST with 100% coverage for the hard macro, which is, of course, crucial for production. So next, I go for a kind of a very brief comparison between CFI and DeFi. This is just to highlight some points which are relevant to this topic. So of course, adoption, everyone knows that the DeFi is the de facto. Um, very long history of ad adoption. While CFI is accelerating, and part of this acceleration is actually by coexisting on DeFi in the same, uh, like in a, in a combo fi. The next point uh, I'd like to uh, highlight uh, is the power. So with the DeFi uh, 1.2, there's excellent power efficiency um, due to the 2.5 uh, gigabit per second. That's, uh, of course, a uh, very good improvement compared to the earlier DeFi. 
Um, however, with the CFI, especially at the highest data rates, we see even uh, further power efficiency. So if your application is like uh, sensitive to uh, power, then uh, this would be an extra point to consider. Uh, maximum bandwidth is the third point I'd like to highlight. Um, <clears throat> and uh, for this particular IP, it's like four lanes in DeFi mode. So operating at the maximum bandwidth would be 10 uh, gigabit per second for the DeFi mode. For the CFI mode, also at 2.5 gigahertz clock, with the three lanes, you get a uh, maximum bandwidth of 17 uh, gigabit per second. Uh, the next point is the minimum number of pins. So with uh, DeFi, the minimum uh, lane configuration is like one lane, so hence you need at least four pins. Uh, we're talking about the serial interface pins, of course, which are an important resource on the chip. Uh, for the CFI mode, it's uh, only three pins. It's like one lane is the minimum configuration you can support. The last point we'd like to highlight here is the flexibility. So for DeFi, all the lanes need to operate together in a FI. Uh, while in C, uh, CFI, you can have a FI like with multiple lanes and uh, they are not uh, correlated together. Each of them can operate separately. So that's one additional uh, flexibility uh, we'd like to highlight here. So the advantage of the Mixel uh, dual uh, mode uh, phi, the DeFi, uh, uh, CFI DeFi combo, uh, the first advantage we'd like to uh, point out is uh, that we're sharing the serial interface pins, the, the, the chip pins, the package pins, which of course is uh, very important for uh, chip and package uh, design. Uh, the next uh, point we'd like to highlight is that we are reusing all the DeFi blocks in uh, CFI mode. So uh, there's no redundancy. All the DeFi blocks used uh, are used in CFI. We're adding a couple of extra blocks to support CFI, but everything which was developed for DeFi was reused by the CFI. So we can uh, say that the combo Phi, uh, it uh, provides the flexibility. At the same time, you're minimizing uh, the area overhead, uh, there's no additional cost for pin count. So, you know, uh, optimizing your or enhancing your PPA. Getting back to our system diagram we started with, um, we'd like to, um, you know, uh, talk about some system considerations uh, while you're doing uh, your XR system, so you need to worry about your application, of course, the total resolution requirement, which boils down to the number of uh, ports you need and the number of lanes per port and the rate per port. So, like trying to connect the dots with the points we just mentioned uh, earlier, uh, uh, we could say that the, uh, having uh, a CD5 combo provides you flexibility, support multiple modes, and uh, multiple use cases, uh, which would be uh, a benefit in such uh, a system. So going next uh, to the characterization results, um, actually this is the bench setup from the Synaptics uh, lab. So the scope used, the, um, uh, the RTV, the evaluation board, we see next uh, the, uh, the CFI eye diagrams. So on the left here is the 1.5 giga symbol per second eye diagram, while on the right is the 2.5 uh, giga symbol per second eye diagram. The eye diagrams on the bottom uh, are all the three uh, differential uh, eyes on top of each other with the maximum channel supported in that rate. We then take a look on the uh, DeFi eye diagrams. Again, on the left is the 1.5 gig eye diagram, gigabit per second. On the left is the 2.5 gigabit per second eye diagram. Of course, this is with the uh, uh, real product uh, package, uh, channel, uh, board. So heading towards the summary, we could uh, highlight the that Mixel, uh, Mixel's IP solution in the XR uh, 
domain, uh, we do have multiple IPs there. Like so we have C5 D5 combo, we have the D5 1.2, we have D5 1.1, CSI, DSI, DSI2. All of them are actually uh, implemented uh, with our customers in the XR uh, domain. So we'd like to uh, summarize a few points. First point is that the combo C5 D5 uh, offers a flexible and versatile solution for both system bring up and application usage. Uh, the next uh, point is that the Mixel C5 D5 link speed, the 2.5 giga bit per second, symbol per second, makes it ideal for most display applications. Uh, for, the, for this uh, generation of display and even for the next generation. Uh, the co our combo IP has been integrated into many uh, end products, some of them in the uh, XR domain uh, by uh, tier one SOC in both display and um, um, sensor. Uh, in, uh, and as I said, mu multiple uh, or uh, several of them are in uh, XR uh, domain. The next uh, point I'd like to highlight is that uh, the Mixel uh, C5 D5 is, uh, is available uh, in multiple configurations. So like TX, RX, uh, Universal, uh, DSI, CSI, uh, and it's uh, silicon proven in multiple nodes and foundries. And uh, at last, we'd like to highlight that uh, Synaptics has achieved first silicon success integrating <coughs> Mixel's uh, C5 D5 uh, into the VXR 7200. So uh, with that, I uh, conclude. And uh, I don't know if we have time for questions. No, we're, we're running a little bit behind. So uh, um, both Ahmed and Jeff will be available for questions uh, at the back of the room or uh, can step outside if you have questions for them. Uh, but we are running a little bit behind. So uh, give a big round of applause for uh, Jeff and Ahmed.